Faith Journey by Stephen Young They blame the libs. They blame the stolen election. They blame Joe Biden's Chinese robot brain. But they were all wrong. It was Steve Young's faith journey, and Antifa saw it coming. 1984, March, Sunday the 25th. March 25th, 1984. The day that Stephen Craig Young was born. Born by a heavily laden stork into the Navy hospital room of Beth and Craig Young in Portsmouth, Virginia, in what was then called the United States. Winston Smith hadn't yet heard of Stephen Young, but he soon would. In a press conference atop his mechanical horse in the Senator McCarthy Memorial Garden, President Ezra Taft Benson tried to reassure the panicking LDS Church, explaining that the birth of a second Steve Young was a coincidence and not a portent of evil, for he was but one child, and they would have decades to prepare for his faith journey. But the damage was too great. After decades of shoring up, the specific culture of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints through policies of isolationism, conservatism, and racial exclusion, the birth of Stephen Young coincided with a new era of glasnost in the LDS community. Glasnost was infectious, spreading around the world. By 1992, it had contributed to the fall and breakup of the Soviet Union, though the leaders assured the smaller republics that they still loved them and the breakup was not their fault. By 2021, glasnost has led to President Nelson willingly taking Bill Gates's microchipped vaccine. Stevens' parents were traveling grifters, and Stevens spent his childhood moving from Virginia to Massachusetts to Texas, Japan, and finally to Idaho, where he spent most of his childhood. Stephen attended the famous Bora High School for Extremely Average Humans, where he excelled in band, marching band, and friendship. Stephen was an average LDS boy, sometimes serving as the president of Aaronic Priesthood Quorums or the leader of Boy Scout groups. It was in these scout groups where Stephen was first exposed to dangerous anti-fascist ideas like the planet is a nice place, and we should keep the planet nice, and small units acting independently but with a common goal can overthrow the ruling class. It was in the ironic priesthood classes where Stephen learned such lessons as serving the community is good, women be talking, and how to patriarch. Stephen enlisted in the United States Marine Corps when he was a 17-year-old senior in high school. Because he was so young, his parents had to sign the contract consenting to his enlistment. The argument over which parent got to sign their son away almost caused Craig and Beth to divorce until the recruiter agreed to let them both sign. His mother remarked, My only regret is that I have but one son to give to the U.S. Empire, forgetting that Stephen had a younger brother, who later went on to join the army. Then came 9-11. Some say that Stephen knew that Osama bin Laden would attack on that infamous September 11th. Some point out that Muhammad Atta is an anagram for Stephen Young, but it isn't. The truth is that the War of Terror would expose Stephen to new ideas and experiences that would affect his life forever. As the tragic war that followed put an end to American civil liberties and Stephen's innocence, so too did it put an end to Stephen's blindness to hypocritical evangelical religion. After finishing his first year in the Marine Corps, Stephen went into the inactive reserve component in order to serve an LDS mission in Belo Horizonte, Brazil. At first, he was considered a scoundrel, roustabout, rapscallion, and overall a handsome missionary. On several instances, he was assigned companions who needed cheering up, an assignment he excelled at for obvious reasons. It was on his mission where, due to constant exposure to EFY music and Utah Mormons, Stephen first began to develop a disdain for Mormon culture. This disdain was the chink in the armor of cultural Mormonism and LDS doctrine that allowed for dangerous ideas like women are humans to begin to fester in his deranged mind. This caused Steve to begin his journey from relatively standard Mormonism towards a more earnest but less orthodox version of religious faith. While on his mission, Stephen's family moved several times in an effort to lose him, though after his mission he tracked them down to Bountiful, Utah. And in between his Marine Corps deployments to Belize, Iraq, Jordan, and Sokovia, Stephen attended Salt Lake Community College, later graduating from the University of Utah, where he was corrupted by the many liberal professors teaching him about geology and rational foreign policy decision-making. In 2009, Stephen deployed with the Marine Corps to Ramadi, Iraq, 
While there, he found Saddam Hussein's stockpile of weapons of mass destruction. There was an accident while Stephen was dismantling a nuclear warhead that caused all of Saddam's WMD to be eliminated from Iraq and from our timeline, making it look like the U.S. had illegally invaded Iraq under false pretenses. In order to fix the damage to U.S. pride and to permit U.S. forces to stay in Iraq for many more years, Stephen was then sent to the Kingdom of Jordan with orders from Hillary Clinton to start a quasi-state in the region based on Islamic fundamentalism. For a short time, it was a resounding and horrific success. In the fall of 2015, it was leaked that the LDS Church hated gay people more than was previously known. This was when Stephen began to really question his testimony. But for the actions of one brave bishop, Stephen likely would have left the church then. Alan Stoneman was the bishop of the Canyon Road Ward, meeting in the Joseph Smith Memorial Building on Temple Square in Salt Lake City, Utah. When the church announced the policy of not baptizing certain people based on who their parents were, Bishop Stoneman resolutely said, We're going to ignore that. This in a ward that met in the building where apostles of the church hold regular meetings, and were often guests of the ward. Alan Stoneman's example of being righteous in the face of less kind policies helped Steve stay in the church for a good while longer. After completing law school and passing the bar, Stephen moved to Somerville, Massachusetts to study international law at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Some would say that his already less than traditional faith journey was derailed on his first Sunday at church in Cambridge when he met this woman. Carol Ann Lidster, known feminist, vegetarian, cyclist, and vagabond, beguiled Steve with her wiles and by claiming to also be from Stephen's hometown of Boise, Idaho. Ever since attending BYU and becoming all liberal, Carol Ann had traveled with unsavory characters in the anarchist movement, the feminist movement, and the I don't even have a TV movement. One of Stephen's first interactions with Carol Ann was attending Second Sunday, a progressive Mormon fireside group. This marked the end of the beginning of Stephen's alternative faith journey. By being exposed to different ideas of what Mormonism can be, and the idea that there can be different ideas of what Mormonism can be, Stephen's faith journey was unleashed. Finding himself with a newly opened mind and an open heart, Stephen began to study and apply feminist theology and the aforementioned glasnost to his study of the Book of Mormon and other scriptures. Everything he read and learned led him to believe that Mormons should be more radically open-hearted in their beliefs and their corresponding actions. Saying that Steve was adequate, Caroline agreed to have him as her first husband. The couple was married in 2017, one week before Stephen's 33rd birthday. Since marrying, the two of them have been competing to see who can be more of a leftist. In 2018, Stephen embarked on a career in comedy. He performed stand-up for packed arenas and joined the world-famous sketch comedy group Night Job. Days before he was to sign a 10-picture deal with Paramount, the country went into quarantine because of the COVID-19 pandemic. The increased growth and visibility of the anti-racist movement in the summer of 2020 led to another turn in Stephen's faith journey. His experience in adding feminist theology to his testimony naturally led to him incorporating liberation theology and radical anti-racism into his testimony of the restoration of the gospel. It was also this summer when Stephen's testimony of direct action was born. From his time on a mission in Brazil to his time in the Marine Corps, Stephen saw how much impact one person can have if they have the desire to act. So he began to act and sing and dance. Stephen is a triple threat. Stephen participated in many protests against police brutality in 2020. Because of the pandemic, in-person church had been postponed, and standing in solidarity with protesters against police brutality was, for Stephen, an incredibly spiritual experience. His faith journey continued down the path left by his testimony of the connection between individual spiritual experience, collective spiritual experience, and direct action for justice. Around this time, it was revealed that the LDS Church had a nest egg of $100 billion and had illegally used some of that to prop up church-owned businesses. This is when Stephen combined his desire for direct action and his skills as a Marine and attorney to protest against injustice, to enlist in anti-fascist action, and to count his direct charitable giving to local food pantries and bail funds for protesters as pre-tithed offerings, engaging in direct action within his church. Stephen's asymmetrical warfare experience came in handy during the summer and fall of 2020, when he led the 4th Antifa Armored Bicycle Battalion during its fire-starting campaign of the Pacific Northwest. After several other successful operations in Pennsylvania, Nevada, Arizona, and Georgia, Stephen disappeared on January 6, 2021. No one knows where he went or why, 
Some say he is a hand model in Uruguay. Others say he went to the stars or back in time to search for Saddam Hussein's nukes. Still others say that he lives on today, moving quietly from town to town, trading Bernie Sanders memes for meals, and telling people about how he had once been a middle-class white boy who came to eschew exclusionary forms of Christianity by embracing Joseph Smith's revelation that anyone can talk to God.